the things that I think that we've seen some of in the last uh, 12 to 24 months, and I think we're going to see a lot more of, and especially in the world of technology, is what I will label here on tonight's show something bizarre and call it marsupial financing. <laughs> and what I mean by that, because nobody could figure it out on its face, is this idea that the new company with a, especially technology companies, will look for the established company right away as a way to come in and say, look, we've got intellectual property, we've got this, would let us be somehow or other part of you, affiliated with you. We'll make less money than we would have, but we'll make money and, we'll, and help us get it to market. And so that sort of, you know, hop in the pouch and get dragged along approach can work. And especially for technology companies, because when we work with them now and they're starting up, what do they really have? I mean, they've got, there's nothing you can touch. It's here, it's programming, it's, it's a fancy GUI interface, uh, but then do I sell it as an app? Do I build it, you know, and try to get orders somehow and then say, what do I do? And we're in some pretty green space with this in terms of what do they do? And with uh, startup money hard to find, turning to players in the industry and saying, partner up with us somehow, help us that way. I think all those alternative forms of financing make sense in another way too, which startups have been told for a while, but especially in the period that we talked about earlier in the late 1990s, where if you had a good idea, it was better to have a bad idea than a good idea almost. And the IPOs that would proudly proclaim that the management team had zero experience, but um, the um, you know the advantage to the, the smaller firms and startups is is that you can establish much better valuations. You don't have to give you know if you were able to raise the money, you're going to have to give away a lot of the company to do that. The extent that you can leverage your customer relationships or improve your cash flow or any of those other approaches um, can be very valuable to the startup. Um, now the one alternative, the one bad customer to have, good and bad customer to have, because I you know a startup in uh, California that does healthcare applications, and they won a very large contract from the Veterans Administration, but they were made free revenue up until that point, but the VA doesn't <laughs> pay. So they had an ironclad agreement, but it was tough for them to get the financing to actually fulfill the agreement, so it's, there's good news and bad news there, for sure. Well, it could be worse. They could have had the state of Illinois for a client. <laughs> <laughs> or, or the state of California where they would get IOUs. There's, right? there's, no, there's no payment problem at all with the state of Illinois. They don't pay, so what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those are solvable cases, though. If you yes. have those contracts, right. you, know, you can get the money. It could be expensive, but there is a solution. Mm -hmm. The tougher thing is that where you're just kind of saying, you know, I think we can get that contract, right? Oh, yeah, if you're, yes, at that point. Um, what about um, some of the newer, um, and then we, some, one of you touched on it earlier, and that is the, the, the legislation that was passed, the federal legislation earlier this year, that relaxed um, investor requirements, relaxed the number of investors before you had to do SEC reporting, um, which has led to the whole thing of crowdfunding. I think the JOBS Act is a huge deal. I think it really hasn't been discussed as much. Part of it is because the regulations are coming out. And, and also, to the extent, a lot of the press has been on the, the crowdfunding aspect. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of, you know, it, it's kind of glamorous and sexy. It's kind of like Kickstarter, <laughs> but they, it only goes up to a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And so it's only going to go so far. So I think you'll see a lot of high publicity type of uh, things. The real part of that uh, legislation that's important is it did really lower the requirements and the thresholds and the costs. Like you were saying earlier, that the companies going public has really cut back because the cost of going public has just gone bigger and bigger. So you need to be billion dollar companies, 500 million at, at, at a minimum to go public. And I think this act really brings down the barriers. So we're gonna start to see companies now coming out 50 million, 100 million, that are going to start to do uh, IPOs again, or you know, take uh, go out and raise money on the public markets, um, and so it won't just be for the, the big guys anymore. So, what aspect of the Jobs Act is really would lead to 
the Jobs Act has several provisions that uh, lower the thresholds and the requirements uh, for, you know, basically if you want to raise $50 million, instead of having to go through all these requirements and disclose CEO salaries and uh, show sophisticated investors, and it's really brought down the thresholds. Uh, I was talking to uh, some of the bankers at uh, William Blair that actually were on the, uh, the committee. Uh, they kind of had a, to write the, the legislation, and they said they put in their wish list of uh, what should be in the uh, legislation, and then it went through uh, Congress, and they thought they'd have to negotiate a lot of them. In fact, they, they define a small company as under a billion. <laughs> they thought it was something like three. Well, okay. nothing got changed. Both parties who voted for it unanimously. Yeah. What about would um, would the um, it relaxes the requirement for the number of shareholders you can have before you have to start to file with the SEC? Would that, in some cases, delay um, public offerings or uh, not necessarily? I, I don't think so. And again, it's it's not just kind of selling stock, but it also be like raising. Debt, so it'll give yes. access to the uh, you know, the public markets to sell uh, you know sell debt, which has been really mostly something used by a much larger company. Um, the, the point I wanted to circle back on was the the different al alternative financing options out there. I think what's very critical for small business owners, especially the startups, is is to do your research. Uh, there's so many groups out there, whether it's microfinancing companies. A website such as Kickstarter with, with the crowdfunding. Um, CNN.com came out with a report the other day that said the average uh, startup cost for a small business is, is roughly $75,000. Certainly there's, there's some industries that um, go a lot higher than that, but that's typically what, what I see as, as a small business banker. Um, you know, what I've seen work for small business owners as well is um, using a variety of options, so bootstrapping. Um, applying for grants, uh, friends and family. Business owners by nature are risk takers, so um, you know, with by taking you know these risks and really making it through that you know first one or two years, which is the most difficult time uh, for a company, you know, they'll see the dividends pay off. You know, after that two year mark. All right, let's. Um, so we. You've mentioned a couple of times microfinancing, Christian, so do you want to comment a bit more on microfinancing? Sure. Um, Other than microloans to people in African nations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think a lot of the, uh, the major banks understand that uh, financing for startups is difficult, so they've established partners, partnerships with a variety of different groups. Uh, one popular one in Chicago is called Axion. Um, I strongly suggest you, you check out uh, their website. Axion is a group that will um, sit with you not only to go through financing opportunities, but carve out a business plan or an executive summary that truly carries you through the first five years of your business. Um, you know, one of the one of the main reasons I see startups, new companies fail because they're, they're flying by the seat of their pants. There wasn't a strong plan from the onset. They didn't truly understand how they were gonna get funding. They didn't know how they were gonna manage the day-to-day -day expenses. Uh, these microfinancing groups really bear down your plan to see what's going to work, what are the gaps, and, and certainly any good business banker will sit with you as well to, to establish a, a strong plan, but um, Axion, SBDC, uh, the Illinois Council of Small Business, these are all organizations and groups in local to Chicago that uh, um, help help new startups. I know just because of the, the type of small business that I see, which is zero to, to five million in annual revenue, um, you know, these financing groups typically lend up to fifty thousand dollars. So um, you know that's uh, that's a pretty good good kickstart. Christian, you bring up a good point, not only in the micro lending, that aspect of it, but the ability for the beginning entrepreneur to assemble a group of advisors. So often, when you're starting off in a business, the sense is that I need to forge my own direction. I'm going to just, you know, bar barrel my way through it. I'm going to figure out how it's going to be done. And in, in essence, so often they, they eliminate making the investments, the small investments that really help them over the long run. 
what I think you're really alluding to is getting people who you can trust, people who have an interest in your success as an entrepreneur, and, and converse with them, take their advice, take their information. A banker is one, an attorney is one, an accountant is one. Certainly those are your three, the three legs of a stool that you must have. But so often, the small business person just doesn't bother to do it because it might cost a few dollars. Those few dollars are an invaluable investment if you really want to get to the next level. And small business owners also do something that is oftentimes even worse, and that's where they do get advice. And there is a tendency on the part of small business owners to get what I call drive-by advice. And drive-by advice is along the lines of, you're gonna start a company, maybe you've got it going a little bit, and you think that you would like to raise some money, and you've got a friend who you know is in investment banking, you went to high school together, and you call him up, and he's busy, and he says, oh, Joe, it's great to hear from you. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, yeah, you're trying to do this. You know what, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work. Here's what you need to do, you need to do this, and this is really the way it happens. And then the business owner who spent a lot of time working on what he's been working on, what he knows about, gets that drive-by advice from somebody who just flippantly sort of, in, in good faith, yeah. they're, not, they're not doing it at ill will, but they don't know the circumstances, they don't know the particulars, and the particulars always matter. And then the business owner changes everything he was going to do because his buddy said it's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And the number of times I've seen that I can't count, it's almost always disastrous. Uh, and it is to the point where I always caution people when they ask me for advice that I don't give drive-by advice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I try to talk in more generalities, just give them things to think about and ask questions. But uh, that's a pitfall. And there's other flavors of that too. There are um, a couple of acquisitions over the last 30 years that I've been involved in is the drive-by advice the seller gets in terms of valuation of the firm, you, yeah. you know, it's, you it's, it's, it's not as <coughs> robust as the investment banker that they went to high school with. It's their, their wife's brother-in-law's you know, cousin who's a, an accountant who tells them that they're, you know, she needs to be worth 50 times EBITDA or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's shocking that in this world where we have so many problems that everybody's an expert. I know. A lot of sense. I do think, um, you know, from looking at some things when you're selling, just from being on the, uh, the private equity buy side and then being in the investment banking where you're representing the companies, is that, uh, what, what, you know, first of all, I think a lot of it's been a loop. You want to have good books and records. Mm -hmm. um, preferably, you'll have a professional accountant that, you know, a reputable firm has uh, signed off on it. Um, I, I think also one thing, though, that a lot of people don't realize is the private equity are looking to, they don't want, even though the perception is that they want a lot of risk, they don't. So they don't like to see uh, heavy customer concentration. Um, they don't like to see heavy concentration on, uh, on one vendor. Uh, a lot of times we'll see an owner will uh, go in and, and really start selling how important they are. That like they have the key, uh, you, know, you know, they brought in all the accounts, they did this. Well, that's a big negative or a, uh, somebody buying, it's good to have a kind of a succession plan or you can show how, you know, that the, you know, without the one person that the, uh, the business uh, will go on. So there's a lot of things that sometimes uh, they need to, it's a good idea if you're thinking of selling the company to, you know, to talk to some professionals and prepare the company uh, over, you know, a period so that when you come out that, uh, you know, you can, that, you know, and you're going to maximize your value. And don't hide things too. Like if you have something wrong, you know, address mm -hmm. it. And I also think you see a, a problem. You see these rosy projections of, uh, particularly these days, when somebody shows you know 20 percent or more growth rate, um, it, it just it, it actually kind of is a negative, not a positive, because you start to lose credibility in uh, in, in the faith in that company and the projection. You make a good point, Tom. One of the things that um, I think small business owners or people doing a startup um, try, you know, they try to paint an overly rosy picture, and they try to, you know, if there's a lawsuit or some intellectual property issue or employee issue or whatever it might be, they try to hide that, and they don't realize that you guys, who they might be talking to, you've seen it all, and you'd much rather know that up front 
it's a much, you know, a deal that's 90% done and that comes up at the end and it's going to, um, that's a really tough, much better approach to just let it all, you know, everybody's got issues. Just put them out there and, and be honest. Um, we're going to take a break in a couple of minutes. Um, so I'm just going to try to summarize the first half and then we'll take a break. Um, <coughs> And we'll focus the second half on questions from the audience and, and uh, over the radio and the internet. Um, but basically, I, I, if I can summarize, and you guys can tell me if I'm inappropriately summarizing, it's basically there is capital available today um, from commercial banks, which is contrary to what the popular opinion is, and from other sources. So capital is available. Um, alternative sources of financing are a good way to start if you're small to get yourself to a reasonable size, to reasonable profitability, cash flow, proof of concept. Um, and that when you get to that point, you really should be prepared and have good you know, books and have the, the story down um, as, as well as you can. And I'm trying to summarize almost an hour in five minutes or five words. Um, but I think it was you know, it's an awesome discussion. Um, it should be encouraging for um, people who are seeking financing. Don't be discouraged. And um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market, but capital is available. So with that, let's take um, exactly on time. Um, take a, a quick, how long of a break are we taking? 10 or 15. 10 or 15 minutes. We'll be back. We'll uh, entertain some questions from the audience, and we'll go from there.